Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for blessing us and saving us and loving us. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful things, wonderful works you're doing before our very eyes, things that have been talked about in the Bible for thousands of years are coming to pass right now all around us. Right? And uh, it's just uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing. We look forward to your soon coming. And now, Lord, I ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of you today, more understanding, more love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the, uh, this is going to be what's called an overview. Okay, We're going to look at uh, a, uh, um, well, it's a, it's a story, actually. Uh, but anyway, it appears uh, three times in the Bible, in Matthew, Mark, and John. And uh, I have all three occurrences because what happens is it's like, it's like w when you see an accident, when, when, when three people see an accident and then they go report it to police what they saw, you're going to have essentially three different reports because some people are, are not going to see the same thing as other people see and some people aren't going to, you know. So what we have now is we have three reports of this, this situation and we're going to read all three of them as they, as they occur. And what God has done here <clears throat> he drawn us a picture of our eternal salvation from beginning to end. Okay, from the time you get saved and born again till the time you get translated until you, until you get taken up to heaven. And so that's an overall picture. That's all. That's the metaphor. It's an extended metaphor. Metaphor means the things here relate to higher uh, uh, things of a higher elevation. They, they uh, 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 the sun. Uh, these are the seed, and what comes out of the seed is the fruit that we're going to talk about today. And it's going to be a little difficult to understand. <clears throat> just bear with it and just, just relax, because it's talking all about you and what you're doing. Okay, an extended metaphor of our, our eternal, our entire Christian life. Now, the first thing I wanted to mention was the water of separation. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the water now. The water of separation is a purification for sin. Now we go, we get baptized in the water. I take you out to the Gulf of Mexico and baptize you, and you get baptized in other places. And you get sprinkled sometimes, and sometimes you get immersed, and it all has to do with water. So let's look at what the water actually symbolizes. We have to go to the Old Testament to see that. Okay, if we go to Numbers chapter 19, verse 9, <clears throat> and a man is clean, and a clean means in the Hebrew. Uh, pure, undefiled, holy. So a man is clean, and a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer. That's the red heifer, okay? And a red heifer is, that's a, that's a, a, a young cow. Okay? And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the red heifer, which is symbolizes Jesus Christ as a complete burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. That's my interjection. You'll see that in a moment, because what happens is the red heifer is taken onto this altar, right? Well, I don't have a close-up picture of it. The burnt out, burnt, as you walk into the tabernacle, the burnt offer, and I got it. The burnt uh, uh, the offer, the first thing you come to in the tabernacle is where you make your offering, where you burn things. Now, some things that, that you burn uh, uh, are burnt, uh, go up to God, and other things you burn a little bit, and then you take part of them. But the red heifer was a complete sacrifice. It was, goes complete up to God, okay? And a description of it is a description, uh, and I don't have that here with you now, but it's a, it's a type and shadow of, of Jesus Christ, okay? So, now let me just uh, do this. And a man that is clean shall gather up uh, the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without, outside the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. And so what that is, is that's representing now the red heifer represents Jesus Christ, who is a complete offering. Every, the whole part of him was uh, essentially burned, which means it went up and smoked to the Lord. And, 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 uh, and then, he, then they say they take the, the ashes now uh, 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 and put them in a clean place, the ashes of the red heifer, um, and uh, uh, shall be kept for the congregation of Israel. Now, here's why. And washing with the ashes mixed with water, washing of the ashes of the red heifer mixed with water is for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. A water of separation. 
it is a purification for sin. It isn't that interesting, okay, that we have an earth. Now picture the earth in your mind, okay? But the earth was is <clears throat> was at one time covered with water, okay? And then there's heaven. So what was the water at that point in time? It was separating the earth from heaven, okay? Because the water was in between. And now, now water is symbolically now, uh, when it's mixed, mixed with Jesus Christ, uh, is a water of separation. It's for the purification of sin. That's why we have this water baptism and we have lots of things in the Bible because the water represents the Holy Spirit. We have lots of things to do with the water. I needed you to know that, that this water is, you know, why I'm telling you this is this. <clears throat> what I'm going to show you in a minute that what the Lord has done is he's taken, uh, he's taken uh, a, a ship, a boat, which was made out of wood, okay, and typify that as, as the church. So in, in this thing that I'm going to read you now, the church is typified by the boat that we're going to look at. So, uh, but I'm going to look at first at what happened just before God did this and, and, uh, and showed us the boat. Just before that, that's called the preface now, okay, Ma Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. And again, this is all going to be confusing for a while, and it'll get a lot simpler as we go. You'll see. And Matthew 14, 21, and they that had eaten of the five loaves and two fishes, the Lord had just given, uh, had five loaves and two fishes, uh, they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children, beside thousands of women and children. So what the Lord did is he took five loaves and two fishes and he multiplied them enough to feed, to feed 5,000 men plus uh, um, the thousands of men and women that were with, with, with the men, okay? Then, we, we, now that was a part of this. Then we look at 1 John, the, the footnote, 1 John, or excuse me, John chapter 6, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they, and he's talking now about the unsaved multitude, okay, that they would come who, who he just fed. He fed all these people. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. They wanted, so what happened is these people, they, let's say, let's say we had 5,000 men, so we probably had 5,000 women and a couple of kids to each of the uh, 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 families there. We, we were talking like uh, 15, 20,000 people that he fed with five loaves and, and, and two fishes, all right? And what they did is they came after him and those, those were, that was the multitude. They wanted to make him a king. That is a, a king. A king, not the king, but a king just like other kind, other kings, okay? They just wanted to make him a king because they didn't have any concept, they didn't have any understanding of who Jesus actually was. When in fact, Jesus was, was uh, 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 they wanted to make him a secular king among other secular kings, okay? Not understanding that Jesus already is the secular spiritual king of kings. He's the king of kings, Lord of lords. So the people, the multitude didn't understand him. And what happened is he sent them away all 20,000, or accepting those, because the disciples were amongst the group, okay? And here's what happened. Now we begin our journey, okay? Now what we're doing is we're taking out of the multitude come the saved. And that's what's happening right today, and every day has been since. Out of the gross multitude of millions and millions of people in the world come the saved. One by one, two by two, whatever, we get them saved here. We got 7,000 saved uh, last year, okay? So out of the multitude comes, comes the saved. So he sent the multitude away and he took the saved people. All they're called disciples. That means a learner, a student, okay? You're called disciples of Christ. Now we're going to read about the journey of the disciples into heaven. Commences. This is when it starts, okay? Because you've just been separated from the worldly people. The 15, 20,000 people who are not saved at this point in time symbolically, okay? Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 and 23 I'll read the black face first, because that's right from the Bible, and then I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. <clears throat> Great voice, huh? <laughs> I don't know. My voice has been playing tricks on me for a while now. Okay. The journey of the, un un uh, the, journey of the disciples into heaven. That's you and me, how we're going to get to heaven. But this is all symbolic, but you have to see the understanding that. Matthew 14, 22 uh, and 23. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and, go and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent 
the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. That's the text. Now going back and looking at that, we see, uh, and straightway, straightway means in the Greek, um, at once or uh, uh, soon, okay, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. Now that's an interesting statement. It didn't say that Jesus asked them to get into the ship or suggested they get into the ship. There's a difference. He said constrained. And constrained means, in, in the Greek, it means to necessitate. He compelled them. It was necessary for them to get into the ship. So now he's talking to his disciples. First thing he says to them now that once, they, once they've been separated from the multitudes on the shore, okay, that's what you've been. You've been separated from the multitudes. Then he says to all his disciples, he constrains you. He says it's necessary for you. He compels you, that's his disciples, his learners, pupils, his students, to get into, the, get into a ship and go before him onto the other side. Now the deal is this. This is the Sea of Galilee. Somewhat like that, okay? It's, it's harp shaped actually, okay? And, uh, that's one of the definitions, okay? And what, what was this? And this is north, south, east, west, okay? Jesus and all these people that he fed we're here on the east side that is called the wilderness. They were in the wilderness. This is the Sea of Galilee. And over here, on this, this is where they were. And when Jesus, this is in the wilderness, and Jesus took his disciples only and said, get into a, the, the ship and go to the other side. And the other side is Palestine. It's Israel. It's the promised land. Okay, let me ask you something. What's your promise? That's if you're saved and born again, what's your promise? Your promise is you're going to go to heaven. That's the promised land. Okay? That's the promise. Now let's look and see, because here's, here's, here's how you start that voyage. Okay? He said to all his disciples, only his disciples, only his believers, get into a ship and go to the other side. So... And a ship would be like, uh, 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 he's talking about like a fishing boat, maybe 30 foot long or something like that, that you, that a sailing boat that you also row, okay? And he says, get into a ship and go to the other side. What he's doing, he's telling those people who are saved, and they get saved in the wilderness, you're wild. I was wild before I got saved. I had no master except me. That was it, okay? But I've now got a master, okay? He, but he takes these people who, who uh, out of the wilderness and he says to them, get into the ship and go to the other side. Where is the other side? Notice that? The promised land. He sent them to heaven in a, figure, in, a, in a figurative way, metaphoric way, okay? So, what's, what's, we, we need to look at this ship and see what, what's his deal. He says, get into a ship, okay? So let's look now and see. Uh, now, uh, let me read it for you again. And straightway, uh, uh, Jesus constrained his disciples he said it's necessary. Ah, because the chip winds up being the church in the end. I'll show you. Okay. He said it's necessary for you to get into a ship, and that, that is in the Greek it's a vessel, okay? It's a, and that means a wooden boat, symbolically the church, okay? And go before him onto the other, onto the other side. Now, and go before him, being supported upon the water of separation, the Holy Spirit. Notice the separation. What, what, what does the water do? It's the, we just read it to you, it's the water of separation, okay? All right? And he said, get into the ship. What, is it, what does the ship ride upon? The water. That's the water of separation. And that's what's actually happening here, because this is the water, and, he, and this is the land, and he's 
He's separating them with uh, and having them to go, go get in the ship to the other side. And that ship is being supported by the water of separation. You have been separated from this world, figuratively speaking, okay? Now, now we see that it's a, a, it's a, a ship is a vessel deep. What well, was a ship made out of? Back then it was made out of, of, of wood. Uh, you know, they, they go out and uh, would cut down a tree and uh, come back and cut it all up and get rid of all the garbage that was on it, like you and me, and uh, then they would uh, make a plank out of it. But let me just, let's go to the footnote number one here, commentary. A ship was a vessel assembled out of wooden boards. Throughout the Bible, men are symbolized as trees. Now you can find that exactly in Psalm uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where it talks about men being trees, okay? And the example also of, of the 48 priest boards of the tabernacle of what well, we call Tabernacle of Moses, but that's not a biblical name. It's actually the Tabernacle of God, okay? And there were, there were priest boards there, 48 priest boards. And I don't have a good picture. Oh, yes, I do here. All right. I didn't see that one hanging up there. Where am I looking for? Okay. This is the entryway where you go into the, uh, into, in, into, the, into the tabernacle. Now, I'm going to say this. You won't understand what I'm saying. The, the, the tabernacle is, is a type and shadow of the body of Jesus Christ. But let that ride for now, okay? But so they go into the, uh, into the tabernacle here, and over here there's a tent, and that tent is supported by 48 boards, and the boards are priest boards because that's what the Lord gave uh, gave the the priests. He gave them 48 cities, and the 48 cities that's a representation of of these 48 priest boards right here, okay? Uh, the boards support. The tent, the tabernacle, that's the tent up on top. That's essentially Jesus Christ. We, we, what we do here at this rest commission, we support the tabernacle, we support Jesus Christ, okay? So we're actually acting as boards here, supporting Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Now, I gave it, throughout the Bible, men are symbolized as trees, as in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, and the example given, the, and also the example of the 48 priest boards of a tabernacle, uh, now, from which, and I have here, Jesus being the great carpenter. What was Jesus? He was a carpenter. Not coincidentally, he was a carpenter, and we are trees in the Bible. What does that mean? What does a carpenter do? When he gets an order for a table or a chair or something, he goes out into the woods, and he looks over all the trees, and he selects one. And Jesus said himself, he said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And in the Greek, chosen means selected. You have not chosen me, Jesus said, but I have chosen you. You're a tree in the woods, in the forest, okay? And Jesus is a carpenter. And he goes out there and he selects, he looks at this tree and that tree and this tree and this tree so on, and he selects a tree, you. And what's he do when he selects the tree that he wants to work with and work on? He separates it from the world. He cuts it off at the roots. He doesn't want the roots. The roots are in the world. What he wants is the rest of the tree. And he takes the tree home and he cuts off all the branches. You know, like a branch, that's just called uh, false doctrine. I got a branch going this way and I got a branch going this way. Different doctrines that are wrong, so on and so on. And he cuts them off and he shrinks this up and he makes this into a plank, into a plank, into a board. And then he uses that board to build a house for God. And that's what you're, you're being used for as a plank to build a house for God. And, and, and temporarily, that uh, initially, that's shown by the 48 priest boards in the tabernacle itself. Okay. Um, okay, so I say here, okay. Uh, the wooden board, okay, the, uh, Jesus Christ takes the wooden boards and he fabricates he changes you. You're, I'm sorry, he takes the tree and he changes you into a plank that's straight and, how will I say, that's right and useful to the Lord, useful to God. Okay? Thus the wooden boards, the planks become instruments, become tools of God. Like I'm a, I'm a tool of God. Right now, I, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, an instrument for God. God's using me to teach you. He's using me to teach you. 
Now, it doesn't mean that everything I say, that's the way it is, because I got Lionel, Lionel mixed in there too, but pretty much that's God speaking through me to you, to teach you, okay? I'm an instrument for God. Okay, and thus the wooden boards of priests uh, become tools of God that are employed to build a ship, a ship. And the ship is the church composed of wooden priest boards, and that's what this is. This is, you take the tabernacle, which was 48 priest boards. Well, they're, they're, we don't know how many were in the ship, but these are all, all these boards are priest boards holding that ship together. They're all holding that ship together, okay? And that uh, composed of wooden priest boards that will carry us, that will carry us into the glorious future. That will carry us. This ship that we're, we're, we were commanded because he said it was necessary. We we're commanded to enter into the church. It will carry us into the future. All right? Now, getting that concept? Okay. And he says, okay, uh, uh, and, uh, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him, being supported, of course, by the water of separation, uh, onto the other side. And the other side was westward. Okay? That's this way over here. Now, here's an interesting thing. He's taking you unsaved. You're in the east section here. You're east and you're going westward. In the Bible, when Jesus was, was born, where did the, what direction did the wise men come from? They came from the east. The wise men come from the east. Okay. And that's what's happening here. He's sending you, taking you here, and making you wise and sending you he's from the east to the west. Okay, Same exact uh, analogy there. All right? And then he's going, so you're going from, from, uh, from, the, from the, being wild in the east to being saved and born again in the promise in heaven. All right? Okay. And uh, I wanted to, okay, now let's look at this. And this is kind of like, okay, we're going to talk about the vessel itself. Vessel. The word vessel is interesting. Because it talks here about uh, uh, a ship, and the Greek is a vessel, okay? So let's look down here at my first commentary about a ship. Nope, that's not, okay, I want to look underneath that. Footnote A. Here's, a, here's like a parable that God gave. Matthew chapter 13, verses, dealing with a vessel. Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50. I'll look, I'll read the black face first. Again, the kingdom of heaven, that's the kingdom of heaven, that's where we're headed and that's where we're in. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now let's go back in and kind of examine this a little bit. And the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net, and the net is the Word of God. That's the net. The Word of God, the Bible, is a net. And the Lord, and, and what we're doing, we're on the ship. We're, we're on the ship our, ourselves as well, okay? And what, what is the ship doing? It's a, it's a gospel ship. It's a ship of salvation. And we're casting a net ourselves out over the sea. Now, the sea in the Bible represents the sea of humanity. When they say the sea, that represents the sea of humanity. And what we're doing while we're in the ship is we're going, proceeding toward heaven, yes, but we're casting the net over, okay, uh, uh, and, <laughs> and the net is the Word of God, the Bible, and we're, we're, we're saving souls. That's how we're saving souls, okay. Again, the kingdom of heaven, like, like unto a net, that's the Word of God, the Bible, that was cast, and that's from the gospel ship now, only was cast into the sea. The, symbol, the sea is a symbol of humanity. And gathered of every kind. So which means that this net is gathered here, like for today. I, I have believers here, but I have non-believers as well. It gathers of every kind. And you've been, you've been 
uh, a net has been about whether you know it or not. A net has been thrown about. You've been and, and uh, you're, you're, the Word of God, the Bible, has brought you here. Okay. And so it says, uh, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea of humanity and gathered of every kind, believers and non-believers. Everybody came. Everybody was caught in the net, which, when it was full, and full means complete, because the Lord is waiting. He keeps saving people, keeps saving people, keeps saving people, catch, catching people and saving them, but eventually he's going to stop, and it's going to be complete. It's going to be done. We have here, but which when it was full, the net when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels. And the good in the Greek means the beautiful, the valuable, the virtuous, beautiful, valuable, virtuous to the Lord for his purposes, okay? And we, yeah, that's what he, why would God save something that he didn't, he didn't have any use for? He's only going to save those things that he has a use for, okay? That's the good to save. Okay, so he gathered the saved into vessels. Oh, there's that word again, vessels. Vessel, vessel, okay. But, what, but cast the bad away, and the bad in the Greek means rotten, worthless, corrupt. That's the unsaved from, the God, from God's point of view. Uh, that's the unsaved. And, and, but cast the bad away. So shall be at the end of the world. Now here's the thing you've got to think about. What do you mean the end of the world? You think the end of the world means everything's, yeah, but it doesn't, that's not what he's talking about. He says the world, in this, in the word here he used, by the end of the world here, is the end of the aeon, A-I-O-N. Aeon means this world. He did not say cosmos. If he said cosmos, that means the universe. Didn't say that. He said aeon, this world, at the end of this world. So we're going to see something happen in this world. All right, and, and, and then we're going to continue on in, in, in the cosmos ourselves. But this is what he's saying about what's, what's going to happen to this world, okay? So shall it be the end of the world, and that aeon specifies this world rather than cosmos, which means the universe. So he's talking about that. Here's what will happen. The angels shall come forth. Wait a minute, the angels shall come forth. Where are the angels? Well, the angels, <laughs> how will I say this now? We have Jesus Christ in us, do we not? And when we have Jesus Christ in us, we have uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit in us, and we have God in us too, okay? And guess what? We have angels in us. What are, how do we have angels? All God's, all God's words. Angels. Uh, an angel is, is a messenger. These are messages from God. Every message here is angelic. It's been given by an angel. In fact, in fact, uh, I read in the Bible where the Ten Commandments were not given by God. They were given by an angel. An angel. Okay? So, I'll go back now. So, so shall it be at the end of this world. The angels shall come forth. Where are they? Well, the angels are inside of us. When I, what happens is when I, when I die, all this body is going to fade away. And the only thing that's going to be left is that burning fire, which is the Holy Spirit, angelic, and the angels. Uh, and I, how do I say? Go back a bit. I'm a fallen angel. Guess what, folks? So are you. We're all fallen angels, okay? All right? Some of us are going to get redeemed, however, okay? Because the only thing, God, God is in the business of, of uh, restor restoration, okay? So we had the Bible, God's going to restore this, going to restore this, so forth and so on. Okay. Well, what is, the, what is the big big thing that, uh, that needs to be restored? First thing that I saw in the Bible that needs to be restored, what happened? The first thing that happened was the angels fell. God kicked the angels out of heaven because they were corrupt. Okay. Well, uh, he kicked the angels out of heaven, and, but, but now we're, we're in the ministry of restoration. And now what's happening is this. If you as a fallen angel are willing to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because those that were kicked out were not, but now that you're here, you, and if you've been changed now, if your mind has been changed, okay, God's going to pop you back into heaven. You're going to restart from where you started from. That's the, actual, that's the actual ministry that God has. He's restoring all things. Well, how about heaven? Well, heaven's got a, in, in effect like a hole in it almost. I mean, in that sense of the word, because uh, a migrant, fallen, migrant angels have, have fallen out of it. He's going to restore them back. Those who 
have a change of mind, a change of attitude, and decide that they were wrong, and now they want to be restored, they, they, they want to be converted, and follow Jesus Christ back up into heaven. And those fallen angels who don't, which, which amounts to most of them, incidentally, those fallen angels who don't want to uh, uh, believe in Jesus Christ, who don't want to follow Jesus Christ, they're going to keep on going down. That's the restoration that we're waiting for. And if you're saved and born again, you're going to go back up. And if you're not saved and born again, <laughs> you're going to keep on going down. Okay. So a very bad fate. All right, so we, so we, we continue then. And what will happen is the, the, the angels shall come forth, and I have read Romans uh, 8, 18, uh, which says that the glory which shall be revealed in us. It talks about the glory which shall be revealed in us. Revealed means you take away this body and you see the glory. What is the glory? This inside of me. God's glory. Jesus Christ dwells inside of me. The glory that shall be revealed in us. It means it's hidden now. You can't see Jesus Christ in me. Okay? But one day... This body's going to fall away, and you're going to see Jesus Christ in me, the glory, okay? Mixed with me, okay? And the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked, and sever, sever, he could have said there, and separate, okay? Now, there's a big difference between the word sever and separate, isn't there? Would you, now let me ask you a question. If you're in a situation where you're going to be parted from something, would you rather be separated, or would you rather be severed? Anybody here want to be, rather be severed? <laughs> no. We all understand the connotations of being severed are much severer and harsher than being separated, right? Yes. Okay. So what did God, what word did God say here? And the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just. Sever is a, a heavy-duty connotation. Okay. I have here, here with force and power. Okay. And, and, and sever the wicked, and the wicked are the hurtful, the evil, the unsaved, in the Greek, okay? From uh, the hurtful evil is the unsaved, or is the, is the Greek. Uh, and sever the wicked from among the just. Just means innocent, holy, and righteous. That's to save people, okay? You don't want to be severed. <laughs> that's, that's, that's uh, indicates a bit of a, a, a how will I say, a, pow, a pain there of some, some sort. All right. And what will happen to those that are severed and shall cast, and cast means throw, them, that's the unsaved, that's the severed, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now the point I want to, now I, I gave you the whole thing because that's a very interesting uh, uh, parable. But now let's look back and see what's going to happen to us. And it says here this, listen to this now. Uh, which when it was full, this net, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good, that's us, into vessels. Into vessels. Well, gee, what kind of vessel? Well, wait a minute now. But cast the bad away. Now I'm going to ask you. A vessel is a container. What kind of a container do you think that, that, that this is referring to? Is this referring to a wooden boat container? Is it saying we're going to go back and be cast, uh, cast into a wooden, uh, into, into boats, into ships? No. It's going to be cast into a vessel. Just uh, now, there's not biblical. It's just from my experience. I would call a spaceship a vessel, wouldn't you? It carries people. It's a vessel. It travels. Okay, it's a vessel. We're not going to be cast into wooden ships again, okay, uh, into those kind of vessels. We're going to be cast into something much more modern than that. And that would be, and, I, I, and the only reason I can say what I'm just saying is because I personally have seen uh, and experienced a, a, a flying saucer, actually existed, me and 5,000 other men uh, on an Air Force base in Saudi Arabia. And I was a weatherman there, and we saw it that for probably about 20 minutes altogether, hovering in the sky, uh, way above. And it wasn't like, oh, way up there where you had to look at the, no, it was like, it was like, uh, it looked to me about as big as like two football fields. Okay, circular, big, but I was looking at it from an angle. It's like, like when you look up at, at uh, well, if the, uh, anyway, 
I, I was looking at it from an angle under, underneath. I was looking, but it looked to be about probably about two uh, two football fields in diameter around, and it had a a, a, a golden uh, a golden greenish glow to it. All right, just kind of like a faint golden greenish glow. That's it, and it just stood there. Right in the middle of the sky with nothing, no other clouds or anything else around it, nothing. It was a nighttime sky, and it just stayed there. Uh, first over me for about 10 minutes or so, uh, maybe a little bit more, and then it moved to the other side of the base. Bing, just like that. It was gone and moved to the other side of the base. And it, it stayed over there for about another, I would think, five or six minutes or something like that. And then, bingo, it was gone. And it was 10 o'clock at night in Saudi Arabia. And in Saudi Arabia, there is nothing to do at night, okay, at all. And so all the lights were off and everybody pretty much was in bed. We would go to bed early because nothing to do. But all the while that was up there, people were calling everybody else and me, and, everybody, and I could see lights flickering on all over the base. Because guys were saying, hey, hey, get up, there's a flying saucer up. And all these guys got up. The whole base wound up being all lit up with people being get up to see this uh, flying saucer. Now, here's, but here's, here's the reality of that. Before I saw that, I didn't really believe in flying saucers. That's something that you almost have to really see yourself to believe in because it's so out of our, our um, thought process, if you will, okay? But now that I've seen one, and, I, and it isn't one of those things uh, like you know, get reports where I saw a flying saucer, it, it was over here, it was a real tiny little, little, little light and then it zipped across the sky. That wasn't what we saw. We saw this huge, big, <laughs> double football field thing Stand, sitting motionless in the sky, no sound, no sound, okay, just motionless. And then we didn't even see it, see it move. It was over uh, where I was, I was way out in the runway, I was pretty much by myself. Uh, 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 and then it just phew, was over on the other side of the base for another uh, time, amount of time, never saw it move. And then it was gone. Now my, here's my problem. I saw it, I believe it, I reported it, it, it went to the Project Blue Book in the Air Force, okay, and they tried to disclaim it and, and tell me not to report it and everything, but I, I reported it. But, but see, because I saw this and experienced it, it's become part of my perceptions. What do I do with this thing? Like for example, if you all went back to where we were, we were sleeping and you saw a unicorn, that's you know, a white horse with a horn in the middle of his head coming out at, at night and he, 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 he danced around a little bit in front of you and maybe spent 10 minutes there, danced around in front of you and then all of a sudden he was gone. You know what? For the rest of your life, your point of view is going to change because you saw something that you know you really saw. It wasn't an imaginary thing. You actually saw this thing, that, that, you know, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so here I am, a preacher with the Word of God, okay, talking about flying saucers or something to that effect. But you know what happened? What happened to Elijah? Elijah never died, you know. No. What he was done is he was taken up in a fiery chariot. Now, 2,000 years ago, or 24, however long, how many years it was, a little over 2,000 years ago, when, when they looked at things in the sky, they didn't, uh, they didn't know what a, a spaceship was. If they saw something moving in the sky and they saw many of it, they would think, well, that's a chariot because the chariots moved, okay? So they were naming things like what they saw. So what's called in the Bible is Elijah, was, it was, there was a, a fiery chariot came down with horses of fire, okay? And Elijah got into the chariot and was taken alive back up into heaven. He got into a vessel, a container, a vessel, and he was taken back up into heaven. That's a pretty close approximation to a modern day, well, because uh, you know what, what 2,000 years ago they would consider a, a chariot because it moved maybe or something. I don't know why, but that's what they associated that thing with. It didn't have to be a chariot. Could have been a flying saucer. Yeah, something to think about. Then not if, if, now, if you, don't, if you don't really buy that story and you, you figure, well, yeah, but flying saucers are just fantasy. They don't exist. I got news for you. 
uh, all of a sudden, this, this last six months or so now, they're starting to come out with, uh, out in California, starting with their car, starting to open up the records now, and starting to talk about flying saucers, and they see them all the time in California. Yeah, they do. Of course, half the time they're whacked out anyway, but <laughs> you don't know what's what, so. But, but uh, so I, I, I just wanted to, kind of, so well, here's my point. I believe it you. says here that we're going to be, we're going to be separated from the unsaved, and we're, going to be, and we're going to be put into vessels. What kind of vessel do you think? Because it, because this is not an imaginary thing, like maybe so. This is actually going to happen. If Jesus said so, and he did, this was going to happen. So what kind of a vessel do you think we're going to be put in? Mm. See? Ah! You need to think about that. See? And I, I'm, I'm heavy duty thinking about it, because I've already had the experience of the saucers, so I know that that's a real thing. Okay. Oh, wow. Whereas you uh, would have would have some doubts not ever seen it because it's so so unimaginable. It's hard to I can understand your doubts because I used to be a doubter too. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> yes. What kind of vessels? All right. Going back up now. Um, let's go to where was I? Let me just go back to the. Uh, uh, I think you're good. Okay, now I'll straight do it again. Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 23. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, which he may be happening again soon to us, okay, which is a vessel, uh, and, go to, and to go before him onto the other side. That's the promised land. While he sent the multitudes away, the unsaved sent away. That parallels what we're talking about here in this, this other... Uh, uh, Terrible. And uh, while he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, as spoken two times for emphasis, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now we'll go to the second footnote. John has it a little differently. John chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. I told you I was including everything in the Bible about that um, in Matthew, Mark, and John. And when the evening, evening was now come, which is about 6 p.m., okay? His disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. That's in Palestine. It's in the promised land. Figuratively, it's in heaven. And it was now dark. And dark it means night. In the Hebrew, night means a twist away of the light. Dark. A twist away of the light. It was an evil time. It's an evil time. And it was now dark. And Jesus was not come to them. And have here, he was not yet come to them, because he's coming the second time. And so we should read it, and Jesus was not yet come to them. That's the second time now we're talking about. That means his second coming. We're coming to that. Remember I said, this is about our entire Christian life. So now what we're doing is we're in a ship, and we're, we're going toward the other side. Okay? Now we read this. The gospel ship is slowly but steadily moving forward, through the first three, as figuratively speaking now, three and a half years of tribulation. Now, let me explain that. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24. But the gospel ship was now in the midst of the sea. Mist means in the middle of the sea. Now wait, so now let's see, now we're getting, the, the midst of the sea means the gospel ship was now here. In the midst of the sea. And it was being tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And the midst of the sea means the middle of the sea, okay? And tossed means tortured, pained, toiled, tormented, vexed. They were in a storm, okay? It was a sailboat in a storm. You don't use sails when you're in a storm. You row. And they were rowing and rowing and rowing, and they were in pain, these, these, these rowers. And that's what you're doing now, because rowing is work. You're working. You're working your way to heaven, through, but it's through God's... God's beckoning, God's, uh, uh, how I say, leadership that you're working, okay? You're doing godly things, not uh, 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 secular things. And, uh, and the disciples were now in the midst of the sea. They were rowing, and they were in pain because the wind was against them. It was contrary, okay? The wind, and the wind represents Satan, who is the god of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is uh, the god of this world. And uh, for the wind was contrary to them. Contrary means opposite, antagonistic, against. 
it was their enemy. And what was happening is these guys were in the middle now of the sea, okay, and the wind was contrary to them. And there were, uh, 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 okay, how hard, how bad of a storm was it? Well, we're going to find out in a second. Let's go to the back page. Now we're going to read about the second coming of Jesus Christ unto his disciples. He's going to come again. He's going to come again, and now we're going to read about it. Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, wait a minute. When is the fourth watch of the night? They had, uh, they had uh, six-hour watches, okay? So the fourth watch, uh, I'm sorry, three-hour watches. So the four, fourth watch of the night was six, about 6 a.m. Well, 6 a.m. coordinates with sunrise, doesn't it? About 6 in the morning, that's approximately well, when the sun comes up. And in the fourth watch of the night, about sunrise, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, the seas is the sea of humanity. So what, by Jesus walking down, that's an expression of his authority over humanity. Jesus is the boss, okay? And it's, uh, by walking on the sea, walking on the, 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 the humanity, he's expressing his authority over the people, over humanity, okay? Now let's look at what Mark has to say about that same thing. The first footnote, Mark chapter 6, verse 48. And Jesus saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. He didn't put the by in there, but it's a, all right. So, uh, and now let's go back to that. And, 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 and Jesus saw them toiling, toiling and rowing. Here, what toiling means, it means this in the Greek, tortured, pain, toil, tormented, vexed. They were having a hard time. This was a heavy-duty storm. I mean, a really heavy-duty storm, and they were having to row against that storm, and they were having a really tough time doing it, okay? And, for, and, and he saw them toiling and rowing for the wind. Uh, that's Satan again, the God of this world, was contrary, opposite antagonist against him. Why? Satan doesn't want you to get to the promised land. He doesn't want you to get to, the, to heaven. He wants to do anything he can to stop you from getting to heaven. And they were, and he was coming against them. And they were, uh, uh, see, rowing against it. About the fourth watch of the night, about six o'clock in the morning. What do I hear? 6 a.m. Now, wait a minute. When did they leave the shore over here? About sunset. About 6, 6 p.m. So, now we're talking about they're in the middle of the sea and at sunrise, about 12 hours later. Okay? So, this has taken... Twelve hours. To get the middle of the sea. Well, what's the big deal about that? Well, here, let me show you what the big deal is. John chapter, or let's go to the second footnote. John chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. And the sea arose, that means in the Greek, to wake up fully aroused, was stirred up. The sea arose by reason of a great wind. That's when all the people are coming against Christians and the sea arose, all the humanity is coming against Christians. They are, incidentally. They are. 25, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, being a Christian, you were, you were a man of stature in, 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 the, in the community. You were somebody people admired and talked to. And now you're a piece of dirt. They're coming against Christians, okay, continually, okay? And then what happened? And the sea arose, the sea of humanity arose, and was stirred up. Why? By reason of the great wind. Who's the great wind? That's Satan, okay? The God of this world, okay? 
by reason of a great wind that blew, that means to breathe hard, that blew, that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. Now wait a minute. They were in the midst of the sea. And now it's what it says here. And so when they had so when they had rowed about five and twenty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. Five and twenty furlongs. Well, let's let's look at the footnote A here about that. Commentary. The northern part of the Sea of Galilee, that's this part up here, was approximately seven miles wide. Seven miles wide. And they were in the middle of the sea, right? So what's that mean? How far were they into the sea then if the sea was seven miles wide and they were halfway there? Three and a half miles wide. They had gone, they were halfway there, so they were, they were uh, three and a half miles. Three and a half miles. Well, that's an interesting number, three and a half miles. Okay. But that's where they were. Now let's read this this commentary. In the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, this uh, was approximately seven miles wide. One furlong equals one eighth of a mile. Thus, about five and twenty or thirty furlongs equals three point one two five or three point seven five miles, or about three and a half miles. A significant number. We have tribulation and great tribulation. I think those those numbers aren't aren't actual. Uh, they're more figurative numbers than they are literal. But in any case, we have uh, three and a half years before the Great Tribulation, and the Great Tribulation is three and a half years comes after that, right? Okay. Great Tribulation is terrible things going to happen on the earth like has never happened before uh, in the world. But fortunately, as you're going to see, we're not going to be here. Mm -hmm. Let's watch. Now what it says now, okay? About three miles uh, uh, equals, uh, or about three and a half miles, a significant number, to the midst. And the midst is Matthew 14, 24 has it in the midst, and Mark 6, 47 has it in the midst, or approximately the middle of the sea. The disciples embarked upon their journey about 6 p.m. at sunset. The average, the, the advent of night, uh, at, the, at the advent of night, night means no light, of course, all right? Twelve hours later, Jesus came from the east. All the wise men come from the east. In fact, you can only get into the tabernacle from the east. This is the east. You can only get into the tabernacle. The only door into the tabernacle is the east door. Okay? Jesus came from the east. All the wise men come from the east. Jesus came about 6 a.m. with as the rising sun. Where does, where does, where's the sun come from every day? It comes from the east, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And he came walking on the water of humanity. So the disciples had rowed three and a half miles in 12 hours. They had rowed three and a half miles in 12 hours. Okay, we understand that. However, a normal walking pace is three miles per hour. Like, that's a normal walking pace. That's three miles an hour. You can walk, cause I used to do it all the time when I was a kid. I, I lived three miles outside of town. I knew what three miles was. <laughs> I walked it a lot. Okay. A normal walking pace is three miles per hour. Had their journey been on land, and most relevantly, uh, relevantly had the wind not been contrary, the disciples could have walked 36 miles during the same time that they suffered rowing three and a half miles. They could have walked 36 miles. But instead, they were rowing. Man, that was some storm. I mean, you know, you figure you could row probably, uh, I always think maybe five miles an hour pretty much when you got six, eight guys rowing at the same time. All right, but they were they, <laughs> they were rowing 
they, they, uh, 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 they could have rode 36, uh, they could have walk, walked 36 miles at the same time they rode two and a half miles. And they were rowing, however, into the antagonistic face of the wind. That's Satan. I'm just saying. I'm just showing you now. This is not an easy trek because you're in the ship right now, okay? And you're rowing. If you're a Christian, you're rowing in the ship. Is life easy for you? Everybody who thinks their life is really easy, raise your hand. I don't see no hands, including mine. It's not that easy. No, it ain't. Okay, it's a job. We're doing things. We have problems. We have this, that. We have all these distractions going on, all right? And, and, uh, and uh, well, there's lots of things happening all around us that are trying to distract us. And these distractions, every one of them, when you're distracted, here, when people ask me how I'm doing, I started not to do that and I stopped. I say great. Yeah. How come I say great? Because I know I'm on my way to heaven and I'm going to get there. Yeah. Okay. Right. But, but, uh, but it's a job. It's because uh, look at all the things that are happening around us that I have to, I have to, I have to take care of to, to go through. Look at all the things I have to go through. Every day I have, I have, uh, I actually have about 20 or 30 literally problems that I have to solve every day. Of, of different kinds of problems, and most of my staff actually are all. And I got, I got, but you know, staff is no different. Than, at least they came, they came out of the cold, and and they're in, into a place where they're they're studying, learning about God. Uh, the rest of the people aren't even doing that; they're still living underneath the tree someplace. Amen. That's right. Okay, what good is that? Living underneath the tree? That ain't getting no place at all. No. Okay. No. All right. So we got, but we're having, we all have problems here. That's Satan. Trying, every time we have a problem, I'm trying to study the Bible, and someone here, and someone comes, oh, I need this, that's right. Now I've been distracted. Or I got this bill to pay, and that I'm being distracted. Or I got this thing happening, I can go see this. I'm, I'm being distracted all the time from keeping my focus on Jesus Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. I got to keep my focus on Jesus Christ. Praise. Okay? But I'm being distracted all the time. But guess what? Hey, I'm still rowing. I'm still rowing. It's not fun. It's, it's hard. I got problems. Tremendous problems, big, a lot of stress in what I'm doing. And you're all doing different kinds of things that are they're stressful too. Everybody's working under stress, okay? And But you've got to keep on rolling. You've got to keep on rolling, all right? Now, let's, now, with that in mind, let's go back up and, and see here now. Uh, I'm reading it once again so you got the concept. And the sea arose that was stirred up by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh, and that means in the Greek it's squeeze or throttle or near, drawing near unto the, uh, they saw Jesus drawing near unto the ship. Some of us, incidentally, are blessed to see or feel the pressure of his coming. Jesus Christ is coming. I feel the pressure. A lot of Christians feel the pressure. It's, 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 you just feel that, you know, this is, it's getting closer and closer to the time when he will appear. I mean, that's pressure. Yep. Okay? And we can, we can see that too. If you're a Christian, you can see that. If you're not a Christian, you don't see anything. All right? And you don't care, actually. You just want to get drunk and go out and get laid and, uh, and uh, gamble and do all whatever you want to do. Okay? All right. All right. So let's go down to, uh, to Matthew chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They were stirred up and agitated, saying, It is a spirit. That means a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Now, the footnote, number one for that, from Mark chapter 6, 49 and 50 is, But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him. That means... When you see Jesus in, in, in that kind of a concept, when you can conceptualize Jesus, you're saved. If you can, if you, when you think, of, if you conceptualize the concept of Jesus, you're saved. That's right. Because if you're, if, if you're, if you're, you're not saved, why would you even bother trying to conceptualize and think about Jesus? Amen. Yeah. All right. So we're looking at that's why that's why it says here it didn't say and they saw him. What the word in here that you don't need that's in there to let you know that is they all saw him, okay, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. The second footnote, John six twenty has it, but he, he saith unto them, It is I. Be not afraid. Now we're going to read about his second coming, 
and the rapture. His second coming. It continues now. Now let's read Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 33. Yes. And Peter answering him said, okay, when he said, Jesus said, be not afraid. And Peter, not Peter, was in the boat. And Peter answering him said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Now what is that? Peter, Jesus says, it is I, be not afraid. And, and Peter says, uh, uh, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Here's, the, here's what happened. Peter said, <laughs> if, if it be thou. Peter had some doubts. Now, wait a minute. Peter's in a gospel ship. Okay. You can't get in the gospel ship unless you're saved and born again. That's the church there, okay? All right. And and Peter had some doubts. Guess what? Now, even though we have we have a lot of people who say absolutely no questions or so on, you know, that's why they that's why they call it uh, the blessed hope. Salvation is your blessed hope. There's a whole bunch of difference between hope and guarantee. Isn't there? It's our blessed hope. It's not our blessed guarantee. Doesn't say it as a guarantee. It says it's your hope. We hope we're all saved. We hope we're all going to heaven. We hope we're doing the right thing. All we can do is read that, pray, uh, obey, and trust in the Lord that we're we're gonna we're gonna make it. Okay. So it's a blessed hope. Peter had a bit of a, a bit of a little problem here. He had a little bit of doubt. He said, "Lord, if it be thou, if it be thou, bid me to come walking to you on the sea." And Jesus said. Come. Just like that. And you know what that is? That word is in present tense. Greek present tense. Come. That means he's talking to us now. Come. I think he always talks to us and says come. Present tense. Okay. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, whoa! He got out of the ship. What do you mean he got out of the ship? Well, the ship's here. Let's just say, now, for example, so he had, you have a gunwale here, a, a, a place, a, 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 a railing on the ship, right? And what Peter did is he got over the railing, and the first thing he did, his right foot, let's say he was right, his right foot went on the water, and his left foot was still hanging on to the railing, right? So, but it didn't sink. It was supporting him, and then... Look at that. Peter is on the water. And then what? The Bible says. And Peter was come down out of the ship. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. He walked on the water. Oh, that's very significant. Okay, why is that significant? That was an expression of Peter's authority as a missionary, right? See, because this represents the church. And Peter came out of the church down and walked on, that expresses authority now, the sea of humanity. He was a missionary. Missionary is empowered by God. Uh, he is a tool of God, okay? And so Peter was uh, doing exactly that. That's like you and I. When we're, when we're in, in a sense of the word, uh, in a sense of the word right now, I'm walking on water. In a sense of the word, sea of humanity, okay? And I'm expressing authority just by really standing up over it. I'm expressing authority over it. Peter was expressing his authority. He wasn't intentionally doing that. He didn't know what he was doing. He just realized that he was being supported by the water. Okay, but Peter was acting as a missionary, and he was uh, uh, expressing authority over the multitude, over the, uh, over the sea of humanity, and that's what missionaries do. They express God's authority over the people that they talk to. And he, what happened? And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. Very significant. To go to Jesus. That's what we do. 
But when he saw the wind boisterous, that means forcible, mighty, powerful, strong, uh, he was afraid. He was afraid. Let me see what I want to do here. Let's go to let's go to the first footnote before we get involved in that commentary. When Peter when Peter was come down from the ship, figuratively, figuratively coming down from the church as a missionary, but also a parallel of the blessings of salvation coming down upon the people in the sea of humanity. That's the church. The church is full of blessings. The church is God's people. It's full of blessings, and it's, it, if it, and it's riding. It's, it's, it, the church expresses its God's authority over the sea of humanity with blessings. The blessings come out of the church, don't they? They come from God to the church, out of the church, down to the people. Mm -hmm. The sea of humanity. Figuratively coming down from the, uh, from the church as a missionary, but also a parallel of the blessings of salvation coming down upon the people in the sea of humanity, a type and shadow of heaven, actually. The, the church is actually a type and shadow of heaven itself. The blessings coming down upon the sea of humanity. Praise God. Amen. Second footnote. But when he saw the wind boisterous, ah, Peter now, remember? He saw, he was walking to Jesus, and you know what, here, here, he got out of the ship and he started walking to Jesus. Guess where his eyes were when he was walking on the water? Where, tell me, he, here's Jesus, while he was walking on the water, was he looking around like this and that while he was walking on the water? No. <laughs> he was being supportive of the water. He was looking at Jesus. And he was looking at Jesus, he was walking on water. As long as your focus is on Jesus, you are walking on water. Okay? You're, being, you're walking in the Spirit. But what happened is this. He saw the wind boisterous. How did he see the wind boisterous? He looked around. And he saw the wind boisterous. That's big waves and terrible sort of storms. And what happened as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus? He started to sink. He started to sink. He started to sink, but he was saved. Yeah, but he started to sink. How come? He's called backsliding. Mm -hmm. Anybody here ever backslide? Yeah. Me. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, you're either not a Christian or you don't know what backsliding is. Because you backslid. Okay, we all do. Here, it's like, it's like, uh, here. Yeah, I've done it. Oh, this is kind of neat. God is a... God is on top of Mount Sinai. Okay? God is, God is supreme. What we're doing is we're saving him more again. We're all, we're all going up the mountain. Every one of us is climbing that mountain. Okay, we're getting closer and closer to God. We're here, we're here, and Judy is here, and Bill's over here someplace, and Tom is here, and so on. And we're all climbing closer and closer, closer up. All right, what happens then? Here, here I am. Okay, I'm up here. Well, I'm getting closer and closer. But then all of a sudden, because I, I, I kept my eyes on Jesus, but all of a sudden I look around and I see, up, oh, uh, uh I'm getting influenced. Something's drawing my attention away, and I go for it. Just like, oh, I want to go out and get drunk, for example, or I want to, oh, any kind of thing I want to do that God doesn't want me to do. And all of a sudden, I get, to, I get distracted. I get distracted. And what happens when you're distracted? I take my eyes off of Jesus. When I get distracted, I no longer got my eyes on Jesus. Oh, I like this. And then I'm in the world, man. The wind boisterous is all around me, and I'm starting to sink. I'm starting to sink because I'm backslid. And what happens is when you're backslid, you, 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 you do it for a while. But then what happens is you maybe you fall down here or maybe fall down here. And then you go, bong. It's like you're on the end of a rope. It's called the golden chain. Okay. And it's in between. It's connecting you to Jesus, connecting you to God. You're connected. You can't get out of it. You're connected. You've got Jesus inside you. That's a golden chain to God. That's all right. And so what happens, you, go, you backslide so far, and then you stop backsliding, and you kind of, you know, when you get to the bottom, you kind of bounce around a little bit. You know? And you're saying, see, I, should go, I shouldn't do this. And I, oh, I, I, I should do I should, I should start going to church again. I should start, yeah, yeah. And then you know what happens eventually? Eventually, you do. You start climbing back up. You start climbing back up. Getting closer and closer to God. Getting closer and closer to God. And you're going up, 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 up. And then you go even higher. Even higher. And then you backslide again. But you never backslide off the mountain. Never backslide off the mountain. You all, because you're saved, you're born again. You're just not perfect. That's all. Okay? You're not perfect. 
you got and you're coming out. You got you got ten thousand influencers out here trying to get to you, and some of them do. So you backslide, but then you go back up again, and just get up and keep keep walking. Okay. So when Peter, uh, Peter uh, as his commentary number two, but when he saw the wind boisterous, Peter Peter was uh, being intentionally distracted by Satan, who's a god of this world, from his focus on Jesus by the overriding cares of this world. That's uh, 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 in the Greek, that's aeon, this world, okay? And that comes from Mark 4, 19. Peter temporarily backslid. But we know he was saved because he was in the gospel ship, you see? Once you get into the gospel ship, you know, no one ever got out of the gospel ship. Do you know that? Every one of them throw a storm here. They're, they're going through all this horrible pain, anguish. They're rowing, 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 rowing. But no one ever said, oh, I'm out of here. And they hung in there. They kept on rowing. Okay? That's why it says here before, I didn't mention that, but uh, let's go back up to the top of the page here where it says um, in uh, Matthew 14, 25, uh, no, Mark, see, footnote number one on the first, Mark 6, 48. And it says here that uh, Jesus come to, cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. And would have passed by them. Here they, here's Jesus coming from the, from the, from the east uh, and, he, and he's walking on the sea and he sees the disciples there uh, and they're all rowing like crazy and they're being in pain and agitated and anguish and everything else. And, what, and the Bible says, and, he, and Jesus, he would have passed them by. What? When I first read that, I said, what? Jesus going to pass by his disciples who were in pain and anguish and crying out and, and uh, need help? And, and he's going to pass by them? What kind of deal is that? Why would Jesus pass them by when they have so many problems? Because the answer is, because they were all saved. And Jesus knew it. Okay? And when Jesus commands you to do something, he empowers you to do it. He doesn't command you to do something that he knows, because he, he's all uh, uh, omniscient. He knows the future. He doesn't command you to do something that you can't do. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> get off. All these things. Uh, get old, you know. You get old, you get all this garbage goes on. And uh, but just enjoy it when you still can get out there and play basketball or do the things, you know, be active and run around and uh, enjoy it because it ain't going to last forever. That's right. And I learned that, you know. <laughs> Tell them. And you get a little sick and you get this, that, so and so on. But, you know, it's only because I've matured and I'm getting ready. To meet my maker. That's right. To meet my maker. Yep. And so are you, every one of you. Some of you will live to be a ripe old age, and some of you won't. You'll die and get hit by a car, or, or lightning will hit you, or, or uh, <laughs> uh, some scorpion will get you and out in the woods or something. Or, or they even got rattlesnakes around here, don't they? Yeah, we uh, do. In places? Wow, I didn't know that. But, uh, uh, but see, if you're saved and born again, He's commanded you, get into the ship of the church and go to the other side. And he would have passed them by because he knew they were all going to make it. That's right. So why should he stop? Yes, you've got suffering and pain and anguish. And you're saying, oh Lord, why do I have this all this suffering and pain and anguish? And why is all this such a problem? Well, the deal is this. Every time you go through this suffering, pain, and anguish, you're learning something. You're getting you tougher. It's making you stronger. It's <laughs> bringing you closer to Jesus. See, those are lessons there. Those are, you got to remember, they're not things they're just arbitrary coming at you. God's in control. God's in control. But how is he going to teach you? How is he going to make you stronger? You can get stronger by getting knocked around a little bit, then you get stronger. But if you're, if you're treated like a, like a, 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 with a silver spoon all your life, what do you know? you got to be knocked around. Okay? And boy, you tell you get knocked around, and you get strong, and you, you, you stand for the Lord. Got it? Tell them. Okay, you're getting. <laughs> yeah. I already tell them. They already know. There yeah. Go. Okay. Come oh. on. Let them hear it. Okay, so that's why Jesus. That's why it says now, because you know, here's the deal. Once saved, always saved. Got that? 
Get that in your head. One saved, always saved. When he said, when he says to you, get it as a disciple, get into the ship and go to the other side. You're and you're and you're saying you say this at your salvation. Once saved, always saved. That's the deal. Okay. See how Peter had problems. He, he didn't. He said, "If if it really be you, blah, blah, blah. we all have problems. We all have ifs in our mind." Okay, but and we all backslide. We all backslide. That's what this is all about. It's not just a straight course. I want to be perfect the rest of my life and go right up that mountain. Zip 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 zip. Man, I'm gonna have problems getting up that mountain, but I'm still gonna keep climbing. I'm still gonna still gonna go up. Why? Because he's helped me. He, you know, well, I'm climbing. I think I'm climbing. That's not true. What's happening is he's drawn me up by the golden chain. Amen. The golden chain. He's drawn me up. 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 And it's just like a fish. When you start, when you get a fish. Let me, <laughs> I got to do that. What do you have? Here, here. You ever go, you guys have been, been fishing. Okay, let me explain what happens when you go fishing. I, I used to do it. I used to go fishing. And I, I, and, I, and we're all fishing the Bible. Okay, it's another another analogy for us. We're all fishing the Bible. All right. So here I am fishing, and and, and, and all of a sudden I catch one. Why? Because I fish with bread. I used to fish with bread. Jesus Christ said, "I'm the bread of life." Okay. You know, fish, not carnivorous fish, but most fish, they like bread. They'll eat bread. If you're out of bait, you have some bread. Just wad it up a little bit and put it on the end of the hook. You're going to get a fish. Okay. Fish like bread. All right. So, uh, so here it is. You catch you catch a fish. Now what happens? Because I'm a fish. I start fighting. So you get hooked, and you start. Oh, I don't want to come up. I don't want to come up. I don't want to go up there. I like it here. I leave me alone. And you're fighting and fighting and you're fighting. But you know, God's up there. Jesus is up there, and He just keeps on drawing you up, drawing you up, drawing you up, drawing you up. And pretty soon, pop up, you come up out of the water. Oh, look at that! You just got saved. You got born again. Yeah, but you feel well. Oh, I don't feel nothing. What do we do? And what you're doing is they put, take you off the hook and put you on the deck. And and this this is you on the deck. What are you doing? You're flopping around because you're trying to get back to where you came from, back into the water of the earth. You're trying to get, but you can't anymore. And you die. That's right. Praise God. Amen. You died to self, see? You died to self, and now you're in heaven. Now yeah. you're in heaven. Now you're just starting to float, and you're starting to go nice and soft, yeah. closer and closer to, to God. Now, the same thing is applying here as well uh, on the uh, uh, backsliding. It's the golden chain. They talk about the golden chain in the Bible. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, they talk about it. And that chain, because you have Jesus in your heart, it connects Jesus to God through you. I said, chain, golden chain. And he just keeps on pulling you up, drawing you up closer and closer to him. Regardless of what you're doing, he's going to keep on drawing you up. Yeah. Now, you can backslide and fight it no, like a fish. Huh? I don't want to know, I don't want to know. But eventually, you're just going to get drawn right up. You're going to go, you can't get out of it. You got saved the Lord again. You, that's it. You're going to go to heaven, period. That's the deal. That's why Jesus would have passed him by. You know, you're going to make it, okay? Praise God. I mean, where I was here. There you go. Now I'm going to come to the really startling part, okay? Okay, let me just. Okay, pay attention. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what happened is, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he that's, uh, said, now guys, you're missing the best part, the whole thing. I'm going to show you a miracle. So if you're leaving, it's foolishness. You have to sit down for a while. That's right. Okay. That's up to you, though. I'm, uh, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He, he walked on the water when, when he's come down to go to Jesus. But when he sent the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. <coughs> He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Whoop, wait a minute now. And caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith. Little faith is a whole bunch better than no faith, you know. <laughs> okay, all right. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. That's a type and shadow of the rapture. Caught him, okay. 
uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Okay. And he caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore this I doubt. So he drew him up. Jesus drew him up himself. He caught him by the hand and drew him up. Okay. And, when, and then it says, and when they were coming to the ship, that's they, that's Jesus and uh, Peter were coming to the ship, that's the second coming. That's the second time Jesus was with him. See, when, when, he, he, when he told him to get into the ship go to the other side, Jesus went, to, went by himself alone on top of a mountain to pray. He wasn't with him. But then, now, he's returned. He's come to them again, the second coming, okay? And coincidentally, it happens at the same time as the rapture, and we'll see that now. Uh, uh, and, and they were coming to the ship. When they, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Why did the wind cease? Well, because Satan is cast into the bottomless pit, Revelation 20, verse 1. And he cast Satan into the That's why nothing, you don't hear nothing from Satan anymore. Because Satan was cast into the bottomless pit. Amen. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Okay. Mark chapter 6, verse 51 and 52. Uh, this is a third footnote. And Jesus went up into them, into the ship, into the ship, second coming, and the wind ceased because Satan was locked up now. And they, now in his presence, and they now in his presence were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered that his admired marveled for they uh, considered not the miracle of, of, of the loaves, but uh, I have it here, but they had not, had considered not the miracle of the loaves for previously their heart was hardened but it certainly wasn't hardened with him present with them on the second coming. Okay. Now the closing miracle. Closing miracle. John chapter 21. This is the only actual miracle I could see in the Bible, actually. Then they willingly received him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Wait a minute. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whether they went. Well, wait a minute. Here it is. They had gone three and a half miles, three and a half miles, we're in the middle of the sea. Now Jesus enters into the ship, and immediately they're at land. Wow, got it? You got it. You got it. And immediately, second coming now, as soon as he enters into the ship, and immediately, and as soon as he enters the ship, Satan ceases, he's in the bottomless cast, in the bottomless pit, and immediately, they're at land. Now, that's for, we got that, and what, what that means is they've, they've traveled this other, other remaining three and a half miles and uh, immediately, and they didn't pass through it. Okay, which would be perhaps the Great Tribulation. We don't get to participate in the Great Tribulation because the Lord says we're not, you know, not to suffer like that. Uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, what you're seeing there, an actual miracle right in print because it, the, the Bible specifies in, uh, 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 I think, all three, two of them at least, that uh, the ship is in the midst of the sea, in the middle of the sea, and all of a sudden Jesus enters the ship and immediately... They're three and a half miles further in the promised land, the promised land, heaven. If that isn't proof of the rapture, I don't know what is. But that's flat out telling you right there what's going to happen. A miracle is about to happen. Here's what's going to happen. A miracle is about to happen. See, I look at this three and a half, this remaining three and a half years from here to here that we don't experience Three and a half years. Well, there's a three and a half year Great Tribulation, isn't there? Yeah. Yes, there is. Great Tribulation. You know what the Great Tribulation is? Uh, uh, it's a nuclear warfare. It's the end. It's a mess. It's a terrible thing. We're not going to experience that. Mm -mm. We're going to, he's going to take us all out. That's right. And now we're in the midst of the sea, still rowing. And when Jesus comes the second time, he enters into the ship. 
Satan has shut up completely and we are transported immediately into the promised land. Hallelujah! Amen. I'm telling you, that's the deal. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. You see, what we've done though, we've gone from you being one of these people in the wilderness wild, wild you got saved right here. You became a disciple and Jesus commanded you to get into the ship and go to the other side and you got into the ship, you came to church and <laughs> when he comes the second, when he enters into the ship, when he comes the second time, which is entering into the ship that second time, he's uh, going to translate you immediately to the promised land. Yes, I know it's you just have to think about it. It's just a, oh, it's a wonderful thing. Okay? But it's the whole, st the whole episode here and all three of these, all three of the, of the, the books in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, and, and John, it is, uh, is uh, the Christian walk. What happens to the Christian? But it's all a metaphor. It's all done with, you know, other kinds of things. But that's what it all means. And that's what's going to happen to you. Because I used to think that there wasn't going to be any, there wasn't going to be any rapture, okay? And no sudden taking out, coming, taking us all out of here before bad things start happening. Uh, I thought, ah, that's not to, but then when I read something like this, that is the rapture right there. Yeah. That did, he just shot you, he entered into the ship and immediately, bang, just like that, they're at land. They're in heaven. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. How, thank you for, uh, <laughs> I was so long, I thought, oh, well, it's too, they'll get all bored. And, 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 but I, it's, it worked out well. Yeah. Jesus Christ said, now for you folks, Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, if, if you're not a Christian, this doesn't apply to you. <clears throat> None of this applies to you. But you can be a Christian. It's an open invitation. If you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus said in John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. Well, what does that mean? Well, Romans 10, 9 explains it. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Born again. Okay. All the Lord asks you to do is, uh, if you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins and was resurrected, if you're willing to believe that and you're willing to say so out loud, that's what he said. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Very specific. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Confess means you're realizing that you've broken God's laws and, he's, and, you're, and forgiveness is involved in that. You're asking for forgiveness. But he wants you to say it with your mouth. So I have a little prayer that I say, that I'll say right now. And if you would like to receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you can say it with me or after me and be born again. And all this stuff opens up to you. All this stuff will open up to you. It's all yours. And you'll be trying, and you, <laughs> it's up to you. And I say this also for the internet congregation, whoever is out there, uh, we don't know if this is going to every country in the world right now, but if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please raise your hand where you're sitting. I can't see you, but God's watching. I don't have to see anything. God's watching. I'm just a mailman. I'm not the guy who does the deal. Okay, I'm a tool for God. All right? But you can say this prayer with us. Now, so I ask, anybody here today would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Please raise your hand. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Yes, back there? Yes. What's your name, sir? Oscar. Oscar? Yes. Good, Oscar. Anybody else other than Oscar? Yes, sir, what's your name? Russell. Who? Russell. Russell? Yes. Russell and Oscar, okay. Anybody else would like to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior? Anybody at all? Okay, now, what I'm going to ask is, because we're all angels here, uh, unknowingly most of us, but we, we are. But I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say this prayer, and I'm going to ask you, you folks now uh, who, uh, who are already saved and born again, if you'd like to say this prayer with me, we'll call it a prayer of dedica rededication. You can rededicate your lives uh, to the Lord with this prayer as well, okay? But uh, for, for Oscar and for Russell, it'll be salvation for them. But 
we all we can't we can't save them. All we can do is we can act like a chorus of heavenly angels escorting them to the door. The door is Jesus Christ. They have to walk through. Uh, Oscar uh, uh, and Russell, would you come forward, please, for a minute? Just both of you, please. Yeah, thanks. Let's go up here. Let's go right up. Go up front, okay? Now, what this is, come up over here and face the uh, congregation. Yeah, good. You see, people don't understand what we're doing here. This is called rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is different. Everybody thinks, oh, they're doing that weird, wild things. No, no. What we're doing is we're taking these two gentlemen, okay, we're going to say a prayer of salvation, and what's going to happen is they're going to become new creatures in Christ Jesus. That means what's going to happen is they're going to be rehabilitated from being a wild, natural man to a peaceful, spiritual man. Okay, rehabilitation means they're going to go back to what they belong and they should be in the first place. Okay, all right. I'm going to say this prayer. Are you willing to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sins and was resurrected? Yes, sir. You too? Yes, sir. Okay, good. We're going to say this prayer. I'm going to say it with you. And you folks, if you'd like to say a prayer of rededication uh, as well, you can accompany me and stand up and say this prayer with me. Okay. And if you don't want to be rededicated, but you just want to say the prayer with me, please stand and be. A, 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 we'll be a chorus of heavenly angels for them, for Oscar and Russell. Okay. And you know the Bible says that the angels, angels in heaven, rejoice over one sinner that repents, and we're looking at two. Okay, <laughs> right here, who are willing to repent, and so it says that they rejoice. That means two things. That means they're. They're watching and they get joyous over one, one, the whole angels in heaven. That's a lot of things, you know. That, I mean, that's a lot of, uh, uh, how I say, creations. And uh, uh, just praise God, praise God. Let's say this with some gusto. Father God. Father God. Oh, I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all my sins and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Father God, please send your son, your seed, your love into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. You guys have Bibles? If you don't have a Bible, see me afterwards and give you a Bible. All right. Well, thank you. Keep these crosses okay. with you and believe in them. And yeah. yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay? Thank you, ma'am. God bless you guys. Have a seat. Please be seated. Everyone, please be seated. Oh, uh, what am I going to do here? Let's see. da 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 -da -da -da. We need, we need whom here? No, we need uh, Teddy. Come on, please. Okay, Teddy. And uh, no, no, Fred. I'm going to take tithes and offerings on each on each side. Do it. <laughs> okay, ties it off. Go ahead. Good. Ties and offerings, ties and offerings. What a strange thing. Why am I doing this? We got we got a whole bunch of poor people here. Not, we're not all poor, but but uh, most of us are are, uh, are close to living underneath the tree. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, so well, so why am I why am I doing this? Well, God God said this. You see, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, money is not bad at all, but the love of money is bad because you're putting money before God, and God wants to be number one in your life. That means this. That's why he's, he's, he's taking a, a, an offering 
uh, which amounts to 10% of your increase for the week or the month or whatever, okay? But he's taking an offering from you. He wants to see whether you you have your money here and you have your God, and which one will you uh, do you love? Do you love your money more than God, or are you willing to sacrifice your money to God and love God more than your money? That's the purpose of the tithe. And, and the Lord says, uh, looking for people to obey him. That's, you know, do the tithe. Now, now I'm going to tell you something right now. Every person here, absolutely everybody here, is liable for the tithe. There's not a person here who could not have put something in that pot. Okay, unless you have absolutely nothing at all in your pocket. Okay? And what God is looking for is obedience. Now, he, he, we're talking now to Christians, and uh, uh, that's, what, that's what the tithers should be Christians, number one. Uh, he's looking for obedience. What do you mean obedience? Well, you obey him. He said, if you obey me, I will open the windows of heaven above you so that you cannot contain all the blessings that will flow down upon you. Okay? If you obey me. See, you're all in the military. You don't know it, but you're in the military. Okay? And the military, you're, you're soldiers in God's army. 2 Timothy says, you are. You're a soldier of Christ. All right? You got it. All right? And, uh, and God wants, well, what happens in, in the military? God wants obedience. God's got plans for you. He wants to send you. Jesus Christ said, uh, go into all the world. He's talking to you. All the cosmos, he said, go into all the universe and preach the gospel to every creature. That's a plan. That means go off this world into the universe and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what Jesus commanded. Well, how are you going to do that? He wants people who are obedient to him to do that. You, you can, uh, I'll say now, if you don't tithe, that doesn't mean you can't go to heaven. Well, sure, you can go to heaven. Once saved, always you're going to go to heaven. Just the point is this. What are you going to do in heaven? Because God's looking for people he can send out into the universe and preach the gospel to every creature. But if you don't obey God in the smallest of things, and that's the tithe, then how about the rest of it? See? How about the rest of it? God can't trust you to go out there. He can't delegate you and say, you're, you're a man after my own heart. You're a woman after my own heart. Go out there and preach the gospel to every creature. He can't do that with you. Because you're not. Because you held back. Because you didn't believe. So, He'll have another job for you. Maybe it'll be a household job or a cleaning job or, or mowing the lawn. Or, uh, I'm just giving you some, uh, some thoughts. But there are cities and, and people and, and nations and, and critters and creatures out there that, that are in the universe. And God wants us to preach the gospel to them. Now, what is the gospel? The gospel is the gospel of love. That's what it's all about. The whole thing I've been talking about all day and, and, and everything I always will talk about is all about love. That's the deal. The Bible says God is love. Twice it says that. God is love. God is love. Okay? And that means that what God's thoughts are, God's thoughts, because God is love, God's thoughts are what? Love. And so, what I'm holding you up right now is a whole book of love. Whole book, love. All God's thoughts. That's what he's given us. His love. And he wants you to take this and give it to every creature. Praise God. God's got a wonderful job waiting for you. All right? A wonderful job. And it's yours for the taking. But you can't just sit back and never open this, never talk to God, and expect to Anything, any kind of a... We're talking about all eternity, you know. Would you, yeah, yeah, sure. I can go up there and mow lawns, okay. What do, you want? do I want to mow lawns for all eternity? I mean, you know, yeah. You get the idea? I want to do the laundry for all eternity? I mean, yeah. I mean these are bad examples, and it's, it doesn't work exactly like that, because no matter what you do in heaven, you're going to do it with the fullness of the Holy Spirit according to your capacity to receive it. According to your capacity... To receive it, okay, you're going to be a happy person, and the guy that's out there mowing the lawn for all eternity is going to be just as happy as the guy who's who's uh, uh, running uh, 15 cities and, and 12 planets. Same happiness, happiness according to their own ability and co capability. God loves you all. God loves you all. He 
Watch your obedience because your obedience shows that you trust him, okay, and that you will obey him. Right. Up to you. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, um, I just ask that you bless every person here, children here. That little guy right there with the blue shot, the thing on, <laughs> bless him. Help him, lead him, and guide him, Lord. Bless us all. Uh, thank you, Lord. You're soon coming. We're waiting. You're soon coming into the kingdom. The kingdom is about to be here. And we're about to be raised up for all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 <laughs> One more thing before we go. Richard. No, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I didn't see you. I didn't see you. <clears throat> I, I, yes, that's right. <laughs> I didn't see you there. Could please sit back down just for a moment. This is uh, uh, Pat, uh, uh, Chef Lennox. He's going to say the prayer, uh, the blessing for the food, okay? Right. Go ahead. Father God, in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we would like to thank you for the message that we receive here today. Hopefully, uh, we all took in the word and uh, are saved by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We also like to thank you for the food, the spiritual food, and also the physical food that we're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. God bless you. All right.